to have you here this morning. Many of you are standing, and you may remain standing, and those who aren't, would you stand with us as we open with a song, May the Peace of God. Am I on? There we go. Thank you uh, for being here. So glad that you are. Would you take your bulletin, please? Let me highlight just a couple quick announcements. I uh, just want to mention two, and then we're going to watch a, a Operation Christmas Child video. You guys can go ahead and get that ready to roll. Uh, Next Generation staff, I want to be sure and mention that. This is the time where we're asking the church body for feedback, questions, concerns, anything you have uh, for the elders ahead of uh, the vote, which would be at our annual meeting on December 5th. And then I would direct your attention to the holiday stroll announcement uh, at the bottom. We'll talk more about this perhaps next week and in the weeks to come, but if you would be interested in participating in that, we have a sign-up sheet uh, out uh, this morning, out, out on the uh, table in the, in the hallway here. So we like to uh, show Operation Christmas Child videos ahead of our packing party to, to get prepared. And so let's watch this one and, uh, and then we'll follow up. I've had a, an interesting upbringing. In my journey, I've experienced God's love in the form of people reaching out when they don't have to, to tangibly demonstrate God's love. That love along the way has been unconditional, never ending, generous, always giving, powerful love that has changed hearts and most personally my, my very own. My family is originally from Rwanda. In July of 1994, a lot of the you know chaos started and uh, uh, Hutus were killing Tutsis, Tutsis killing Hutus. My mom was eight months pregnant. They had just built a new house and my dad realized that with two young boys and one daughter, they need to get out. And that's when they decided to flee to the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I was born a month later there. Then after that, we bounced around the world because we had nowhere else to go. And that's when we moved to Togo. So I was a refugee for 14 years of my life. I've never met any of my my grandparents, uh, my uncles, my cousins, many of them were, were killed. And it's not just my family, a million people fell in the span of 100 days in the Rwandan genocide. Knowing that fact broke me as a kid. I was wary of humanity because I knew what they were capable of, the evil they were capable of. 
and I harbored a hatred for them, a radical hatred for them. I grew up calling myself a Christian, uh, but my faith wasn't my own. It was my, my parents. My parents there were, were pastors in Togo and uh, heard the gospel, read the Bible, but none of it re reached me, really. Because of hardened heart, pride, just hatred, over and over I walked away from God's love, but he, he was always there. You know, something that changed the course of my life was my first gift, the first gift I'd ever received. As I opened the shoebox, the items in there were incredible. The first thing I remember pulling out was a scarf, a scarf that I still have. There was a red toy car in my box. That was my favorite item that day. At the very top was a sticky note. The words on that sticky note read, God loves you, Jesus loves you, I love you. Now, I had heard the first two lines before, but that last one wrecked me because it was an I love you from a member of that very humanity I grew up hating. And they were telling me essentially, Eve, despite your hatred for me, I love you anyway, man. And here's proof of my love for you in the form of the first and only gift you've ever received. That shook my world to the core. God began to use that sticky note to start working on my heart. It didn't happen overnight. I'm still a work in progress. His love never left our side. His ever-flowing, never-ending, always-giving, generous, powerful love. And then a shoebox gift. That's what God used to free me from the burdens of hatred. I have never been the same because of that shoebox that still continues to change my life. I'm going to go ahead and have Daryl come on uh, forward for the scripture and prayer. There, there's a lot of details we could share about uh, Operation Christmas Child. A lot of them are in your bulletin, so please read. Uh, our packing party is November 14th, Sunday, uh, at 12.45. Uh, I appreciate the videos that, that the team passes on to show uh, on Sunday. What a powerful story. The one other detail I want to share with you, is what, what struck me about that is the note. And uh, I know that they are asking for help writing those notes. How, how simple. God loves you. Jesus loves you. I love you. And uh, if you would be willing to help us write some of those notes that will go in the shoeboxes on the 14th, uh, I'm, I'm seeing uh, Mariella and Sandy nod their heads a little bit. They, they, they could use that help. So talk to them if you have any questions. If not, they're right there on the table And uh, as we prepare for the 14th. Thank you, Daryl. Yeah, I was at the, at the Dollar General yesterday and they had items for Operation Christmas Child, 70% off and then 50% off the lowest price. It's like buying shoes for like 75 cents a pair, brand new shoes. And it, you, you just loaded up everything they had. So keep your eyes open. These things, you know, you come across them once in a while. But uh, well, what, a, what a moving testimony, isn't it? And uh, we know we've seen these for years and we, we're seeing a few, you know, two or three or four stories a year, but you know, there's a, you know, millions of these boxes that go out. So these stories are multiplied around the world. So uh, what, a, what a great opportunity the Lord's given us to uh, be involved in Operation Christmas Child. It's, it's exciting. We're always looking forward to it. So lots of work to do though. All right, our, our scripture reading today, Psalm 34, if you would, if you care to turn there or you can listen to me as I read it. Psalm 34, um, <coughs> Uh, Pastor Steve's going to be talking a, a little bit about Satan, you know, our great enemy. That's in Revelation 12. We'll be reading about him. And, and um, you know, he's been our enemy since before humanity even existed. <laughs> you know, he was there ready to 
destroy humans when we were first created. And so um, all of the people who follow after Satan, in one sense, are also our enemy. And, uh, but David rejoiced in the fact that God is for the righteous, and he is against the enemies of the righteous, and then all of those who are doing evil. And, uh, you know, we believe that God will ultimately defeat Satan, and, and that is so sure um, that we can rejoice and we can rest in that, um, in that confidence. So let's read David's perspective a little bit as he uh, points us to God in Psalm 34. I'm going to start in verse 11 through the end of the psalm. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Well, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles, all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saved, saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Let's pray. Father, what great uh, truths here. <laughs> it just goes right in with what we just heard in Sunday school time and at the refuge that that Christ is to us and just the fact of him working things out for good for um, all of us who love him and who are called according to his purpose. So Lord, what a, what a blessing it is that we can have the peace, the peace of God in our lives. And, uh, just trusting that uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a, uh, some kind of a health problem or, or political issues that are stirring our soul or or whether it's um, loss of a loved one or conflict or pain or suffering or persecution there's so many all of the hardships that we'll face Lord you will deliver us from all of them you will work them all out for our good what what promises is that and I just pray for each one here for the for the grace to to walk in those truths, to remember them, to live according to them. Lord, it is good to, to hear um, that despite all the best efforts of our enemy and, uh, and all those who would follow after our enemy, Satan, um, that you will deliver us from those schemes. You have, through your spirit, given us the, the power to resist evil, to do what is right, to walk in your ways, and you're actively at work helping us. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together with one another as believers, as um, brothers and sisters in this great salvation in Christ. Um, what, what joy we have to be here, and we thank you for providing all of our needs this past week, and we thank you that you'll provide all of our needs going forward as we put your kingdom first. I pray that you, O oh God, would be glorified um, as we sing to you, as we look into your word in a little bit, and as um, we, we use our gifts to build one another up and, and encourage one another, and even so much so, uh, so as we see the, the day of Christ approaching. Lord, um, I pray you'd be honored and glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name. Would you stand with us again? as we continue to worship by singing All in All.
Grab your Bibles, please, and join me in Revelation chapter 12. We are past the halfway of this book now together and uh, did a quick look at our schedule this week. And uh, it looks like our study in this book of Revelation should take us through the the winter months, uh, give or take a few weeks. So thank you for uh, walking through this great book with me in the last several months here, and today we are ready for chapter 12. I would like to just start by reading uh, our entire text together today. It's, it's a lengthier chapter, a lot going on here, and uh, why don't we uh, read, starting in Revelation 12, 1. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Verse 7, now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Verse 13, and when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle so she might fly away from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured forth from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. When Chuck Swindoll began to preach this sermon on on this chapter, he said to his church, quote, I prayed all week that Jesus would return before I had to preach this text. (laughs) This is a difficult chapter. In fact, in my opinion, chapter 12 begins the most difficult section of the book as a whole. I find chapters 12 to 18 to to be very, very difficult to wrap my mind around. You have different uh, difficult interpretive choices in these chapters, but even on top of that, I would say that I just find it hard to find my bearings in these chapters, including today's. I'd like to play a video clip for you as we get started this morning. Uh, It's about four minutes. It's from the Simeon Course on apocalyptic literature. 
we do a, a Simeon course here at New Life called First Principles. Right now we're kind of halfway through with a group that's doing a fantastic job. Uh, this video is from the Simeon Courses series on apocalyptic literature, of course, which Revelation is a part of that uh, genre. You're going to hear from David Helm in this video. David Helm does a lot of the uh, Simeon Course videos. He's a pastor in the Chicago area. And we pick it up with David Helm talking about why we avoid the book of Revelation. Why do we avoid it? What is it about apocalyptic literature, Revelation, that makes it so that we want to avoid it? Avoid reading it in your quiet time, avoid preaching on it, avoid studying it in your small group, etc. Listen to what he says. I think we're right at the, the right point here, and then I'll, I'll let you know, Manny, when to stop it. But, but you take a listen, and then we'll... Three words, and you can tell me if you like it, why we avoid it. Um, some of this that you've mentioned, this is a different kind of literature just different. Uh, in other words, we avoid it because we are unfamiliar with it. Who likes to deal with things that are unfamiliar with? I mean, let me tell you why I've never done a Sudoku, because I'm afraid I wouldn't be any good at it. And if I try one, I might actually have to deal with all that unfamiliarity, so I won't do one. My wife can knock these things out all day long. But it's different stuff, and I'm not touching it. Um, I think of John Barton's quote, which is uh, in a book called Reading the Old Testament. Um, listen to this. Quote, we instinctively know that a sentence that begins, quote, the stars will fall from heaven, the sun will cease from shining, and the moon will drip blood is not going to end and the rest of the country will be partly cloudy with scattered showers. <laughs> We're unfamiliar with the way language works in this genre. It's different. Not only that, it's difficult. In one sense, you could put it, um, we are unprepared for it. Preachers are unprepared for it. This hits, in a sense, on our, on our uh, end of preparation. And as a result, we actually lack confidence. Let me see if I can say the distinction between this literature and other literature that you're prepared for. If you had any training, formally or informally, for pastoral ministry, at some point, I guarantee you, you cut your teeth on epistles, Pauline epistles, in regard to how to preach. And so the tools that you were given to do well in that literature are tools that are made in a sense for an archeological dig. And so you're given uh, the brush with which to diagram the place out that you're giving. You're giving tiny spades and shovels and repetition of terms, but you all the while, what? When you're on an archeological dig, where are your feet? Your feet are on solid ground familiar territory, and everything in front of you has a, a sense of, uh, I've been equipped for this. When you're on apocalyptic literature, you are not on an archaeological dig, you are, you are over open water. That's the difference by way of preparation. This, this is sailing, and in sailing, you don't have the same tools at your disposal to navigate yourself to a harbor. In fact, when you're sailing, everything beneath you is shifting, moving, seems to be here, but only momentarily and then gone. And the way in which you have to look for the meaning is you got to be able to read the stars. I mean, you're out at night and your only way home is to interpret the hanging stars in the universe. We're not familiar with that. We're not used to doing Bible study that way. And so this presents an issue for us. And then one more, it's divisive. In other words, it isn't just that we're unfamiliar with it or that the preacher is unprepared for it. It's that people historically have gotten unhinged over it. We're aware of this. So as a result, we steer clear of this. Let me say a word or two on why I think we should undertake it, okay? Because 
you got to confront those realities. But now that you know those. Thank you very much, Manny. A lot of, lot of great things there to, to unpack. But I want you to focus this morning on the part, the second word, difficult. It, it's difficult. Studying Revelation, what we've been doing is like being in open water. <laughs> it requires a different set of tools. He, he said everything seems to be shifting and moving. Things seem to be here for the moment. We seem to be right here, and then all of a sudden we're over here. And I wanted to show you that clip today because that's exactly how I felt this week in Revelation chapter 12. In fact, I, I don't know that we've quite felt that way until now, or perhaps to the degree that we do today in chapter 12. Revelation 12 is open water. Things are shifting and moving. We think that we're here in one moment of time, and you're going to see this, then we're here in a different moment of time. Revelation 12, and quite frankly for me, 12 through 18 are very difficult. And so we need to pray, don't we? We'll do that in a moment, but first let me quickly remind ourselves of where we are in this book. We heard the seventh trumpet sound last week. We had this great announcement of the kingdom of the world becoming the kingdom of God and Christ, and, and, and we think now that we'll roll right into the bold judgments, right, according to this diagram, but that's not the case. The bold judgments don't start until chapter 16. And so in chapters 12 through 15, we're dealing with something else, and so in that way, we're kind of disorientated a little bit. We'll talk about where we are at the end of the message, but for now, just realize we are between the seventh trumpet sounding and the first of the bold judgments, and we will be here for the next few weeks to come. All right, join me in prayer, please, and let's ask for the Lord's mercy as we study his word. Lord, that is a good word for us this morning to seek you for just your mercy, your help, um, show us favor, Lord, to, to not only understand this difficult text where we feel like we're on open water, things are shifting and moving. We're not used to finding our way home by looking at the stars, and then we've had these images here that are puzzling to us. So we ask for your help, but not only just for uh, that understanding, but for application as well, that we might be changed that we might come to know Christ as Savior and then be conformed into his image more and more. And it's in that name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right, let's walk through this wonderful but challenging chapter together. I'm going to start with the woman, the child, and the dragon. All right, the woman, her child, and the dragon. In 1 through 6, we are introduced to two main characters. Now, there's a third one in here, but... I'll just say two main ones for now. The first thing I want to point out to you right off the bat is that they are both called signs. Please don't miss that. Look at verse 1. A great sign appeared, the woman. And then verse 3. Another sign appeared, the dragon. The view I'm presenting to you this morning is that this is not an actual singular woman. Nor is this an actual dragon. These are signs. They represent something. And so let's first talk about the woman, the sign of the woman. In verses 1 through 2, we're told right away she's clothed with the sun. The moon are at her feet. These probably bring the ideas of glory and majesty. Uh, this woman is special, exalted. There's splendor here. We're told that she has on her head a crown of 12 stars. It's the Stephanos crown here in the text. We've seen this term already multiple times in the book. It's a crown that's given to a person, like the athlete in, in uh, John, our author's day, or a exalted, uh, rewarded military commander. So we might have a clue there that this honor, this splendor, is, is given to the woman. It's bestowed by someone higher. 
And then we have something with the number 12, don't we? 12 stars in her crown. Let me go ahead and talk about who exactly this woman represents. As you can imagine, interpretations are varied. Some toss out Christ himself. Some say Mary, the mother of Jesus. I don't believe either one of those are the best options for us. The most common ideas, it seems, is that this woman represents either the church or the nation of Israel. And then I found that some even propose a combination of the two and just put it under the umbrella of God's people. That's an interesting option, but I'm going to propose to you this morning that this woman stands for the nation of Israel. And here's why I say that. If you look at Genesis chapter 37, you don't have to turn there, but if you look at Genesis 37, we have the account of Joseph's dreams. Do you remember this? Joseph has these dreams that make his older brothers furious. He dreams, listen, that the sun and the moon and 11 stars bow down to him. And clearly in that passage, the dream is representing his family, his father, his mother, his 11 brothers bowing down to him. The sun was Jacob, his father. The moon was Rachel, his mother. And the 11 stars were his 11 brothers. Many believe that this is the imagery that's being picked up here in Revelation chapter 12. This woman is surrounded by the sun, the moon, and 12 stars. It brings to mind uh, Jacob Israel, Rachel, and the 12 sons of Jacob Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. Therefore, it seems like a good interpretive option to see this woman as representing the people of Israel, God's special chosen instrument. You have those pieces of evidence, but then perhaps most of all, we have the revelation given to us in verse 2, and it's quite a revelation. We're told in verse 2 that the woman is pregnant. Indeed, she's giving birth in this moment, and that she has a child. If you skip down and look at verse 5, we're told specifically that the child is male and that he will, quote, rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Who is the child? The child is clearly Jesus Christ himself. Psalm 2, which is going to be uh, flashed up here for you, is an interesting chapter that we have seen already. Do you remember Daryl read it last week? Uh, early in the service, and then we saw Psalm 2 a couple of different times last week. Look at, as we see Psalm 2 again, look at the last sentence. You shall break them with a rod of iron. Psalm 2 comes in again this week. The one who will rule the nations, earlier in the text there, will rule with a rod of iron. This is clearly a messianic prophecy spoken in David's day and picked up now in John's sign of the woman and the child. This child in this sign is clearly the Messiah, Jesus. One author said, quote, Israel is the matrix from which Jesus came into the world. Israel here is pictured as bringing forth the Messiah. So where are we in time? Shifting. Okay, keep, be prepared for that. Where are we right now, though, in time? We're in the past, aren't we? We are at Christmas. Jesus, the Messiah, his first advent coming to this earth. Now, at this point, then, we're introduced to the second sign, and you can jot this down. We have the second sign of the dragon. Look at verse 3 again. Another sign appeared in heaven. A great red dragon, seven heads, ten horns, heads are holding seven diadems. This sign is a bit easier for us. We like that uh, because we're told exactly who this is or what this stands for. Look at verse 9. Skip down to verse 9. We are clearly told that this dragon is Satan himself. He is pictured here as a great red dragon, again, a sign where we're not meant to believe that Satan in reality has the appearance of an actual dragon. This is a sign. He is pictured in this way, and we notice that he has seven heads, ten horns, and seven diadems on those heads. We will probably get more into this in the next week or two from chapter 13, but let me say this for now. 
The seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns imagery brings, generally speaking, a picture of the authority and power of Satan. Authority and power, he has those. But many also see the idea, perhaps, of a grouping of ten nations in the end of time that Satan will wield power over and through in connection with the Antichrist here. I trust we will get more into that in the next couple of weeks, so hang with me on those thoughts. For now, I want to focus on the general. He wields power and authority. Talked about that a little bit last week. Horns being the ancient symbol of power and strength, especially military power and strength. So we have Satan here. He is the dragon. But watch now. Verse 4 begins to tell us his actions, his actions. First of all, we are told that his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth. This is probably a reference to how Satan was cast to earth with one third of the angels that we now call demons. The Bible presents the idea that at some point before Satan tempted Adam and Eve in the garden, he, Satan, led a rebellion against God, and we see a reference here to the idea that he was cast from heaven and he took with him, swept down with him, one-third of the angels, now demons. There's a lot more we could say there, but for the sake of time, we note that's a common understanding of verse 4. By the way, a couple things to note. Notice we've jumped back in time, <laughs> Right? We were just talking about Christmas, and now we're back before the temptation of Adam and Eve, shifting waters. Also, please note that the scripture presents, and, and please listen carefully to this, because it'll help the rest of the chapter make sense. The scripture presents the idea that though Satan was cast from heaven, he still has access to the heavenly places. We see him in the book of Job stand before God in heaven and accuse Job of only walking with God because of how you bless him materially. That's Satan's accusation before. He has access to the heavenly places. Keep that thought in mind. But moving on, we're also told in verse 4 that Satan stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her. We're back to Christmas and the life of Christ. What's this showing us? It is showing us that Satan clearly, purposefully, furiously desired to devour Christ during his time on the earth. Do we see that played out in the Gospels? Some authors I read this week uh, noted first and foremost the rage of King Herod killing the babies of Jerusalem. And what was his purpose for that? To kill Jesus, the Messiah. Some noted the crowd of Nazareth wanting to push Jesus off of the cliff. Some noted other attempts to kill him that John and his gospel clearly speak to. John writes, from this point on, they sought a way to kill him. Clearly, Satan sought to devour the Messiah. By the way, that's something I appreciated about the movie, The Passion of the Christ, for those of you who have seen that. Presented the idea multiple times of Satan's purposeful activity to frustrate Christ's mission and even devour him, if you will. So Satan, what, what an image here. It, it is set to devour the child being born. But look at where the text goes next speaks of God's protection of the child and the woman in 5 through 6. Verse 5, she gave birth to the child, the, the one who rules with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. This is a reference to the ascension of Christ. He was victorious over Satan at the cross. God raised him from the dead. He ascended back to heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father. God protected Jesus from the rage of Satan on earth. But God also protects the woman. Look at verse 6. 
The woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. Again, open water, where are we now? <laughs> the 1260 days takes our mind back to the end of time tribulation. That's three and a half years, the last half of the tribulation that we've been talking about in this book. We're shifting. During this time, Satan is seeking to harm Israel, and God will protect her. That's the main idea of verse 6. You can talk about, well, what, where is this place? What is this desert place? Some people point to, is it uh, Petra? You know, that fortress in the, in the desert there outside of Israel. Okay, you can talk about what the place is, but don't miss the main point here. God is protecting the woman. From Satan's fury in those days. Now, that idea is going to be expanded here in a moment when we get to verse 13. We're going to revisit God's protection. But for now, we shift yet again, verses 7 through 12, to a war in heaven. We've been on earth. We've just kind of started to gain an understanding of what these signs are, and now we're off to heaven. Open water. Hard to get our bearings. But let's do our best. Write it down in 7 through 9, we're exposed to the war in heaven, the war in heaven. We are told, look at verse 7 again, that this battle is between Michael and his angels versus the dragon, Satan, and his angels, demons. Now, the timing of this battle is much debated. Is this back to when Satan was originally cast from heaven, sometime between the creation of angels and the temptation of Adam and Eve? Is that where we are? Uh, are we at the cross, some say? The cross, the time of Jesus' death, some, some say that. Some say it's a future tribulation time period battle. That's the time frame that I would point you to, though it's much debated. This is a future tribulation period battle in heaven. That's why it was so important to point out to you earlier that Satan still has access to the heavenly places, though he was cast to earth. Michael and faithful to God angels versus Satan and demons. We don't know what the weapons are going to be. <laughs> we don't know exactly what John is seeing here, but no doubt it must have been an incredible sight. By the way, Satan and Michael have fought before. Do you realize this? That this should not be a foreign idea to us. Like an odd, strange idea. We see it referenced in the book of Daniel uh, between Michael and, and evil forces. And then in the little, little book of Jude, we read that Michael and Satan fought over something. Does anyone remember what that was that they were fighting over? Very interesting. The body of Moses. Fighting over the body of Moses. You, you look that up in, in Jude, which is right uh, before our book of Revelation. Listen, here's the point of angels conflicting is not so strange to us. Now, of this battle, we are simply told in 8 and 9 that Satan is defeated. I mean, it's a simple statement, but it's wonderful. Look at 8 again. Satan is defeated. There was no longer any place for him in heaven. The great dragon is thrown down, and then many names are mentioned. Ancient serpent, devil, Satan, deceiver, thrown down, and also his angels. Aren't those great verses? There's no longer any place in heaven for Satan and his demons. Again, a couple of different time stamps you could put on this, but we are proposing that at some point in the end tribulation period, Satan and his demons lose this war and they lose their access to heaven. No more do they have access, like in the book of Job. Notice the names John uses here, the dragon, the ancient serpent, devil, Satan, deceiver, this enemy of God and enemy of God's people no longer has access. He is banished. And then in 12, uh, 10 through 12, write this down, we have a great hymn of heaven, the response to Satan's banishment. Wonderful section here. Actually, it's more like a yell 
than a hymn or a song. John hears this loud voice in heaven yelling this song or hymn, if you will. It, it reminded me this week of the rebel yell from the Civil War. Do you remember that? Have you heard about that? A rebel yell made famous by the Confederate soldiers in the Civil War. This, they had this famous battle yell. It's only speculated today about it, what it actually sounded like because uh, we hardly have any recording of it, it I've heard. This is a sort of post-battle yell in heaven. I'd like to read this section again. Go ahead and, and flash that next slide up, Manny. Would you read this with me, please? It's, it's a little bit lengthier, but it was a loud voice, and, and I'm not going to just scream it, so I want all of our voices to, sing, uh, to say this, okay? Let's read it together. We'll find a, a rhythm here. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. Lift your voices. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Good job. This is a victory cry of heaven, folks. A great section of not just this chapter, but this book. A couple things I want you to note in that response. First of all, Satan has a new name in here, the accuser of our brothers. Did you see that? We've already mentioned his accusation against Job recorded in that book. We also see, by the way, Satan accusing Joshua, the high priest, before God in Zechariah chapter 3. You can look that reference up later if you want, Zechariah 3. Day and night, note that, day and night, Satan accuses believers before the throne of God. Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore in this day. Secondly, I want you to notice verse 11. In verse 11, we are clearly looking at martyred believers. Martyred believers. Satan is accusing them, but they conquer him. Notice, by their faith in Christ, by the blood of the Lamb, and their salvation is evidenced by their faithful stand for Christ, their testimony, even though they die for it. We are looking at tribulational believers who remain faithful to Christ even unto death. Believers who came to believe, repent and believe, since the events of the tribulation have begun. Finally, notice what Satan knows. <laughs> I love this. He knows that his time is short. We have another sweet and sour in these verses. Do you remember the sweet and sour scroll from a few weeks back? Heaven rejoices at Satan's banishment, verse 12. Look at it again, verse 12. Uh, heaven rejoices, that's the sweet. Here's the sour, woe to the earth. Why? Because earth, you are receiving an enraged Satan and demons in this day. Why? Because he knows his time is short. The earth is about to be the unwilling stage of Satan's last stand. In fact, let's look at that together as we wrap up the text and then we'll move on to wrapping up everything this morning. Look at Satan's last stand, the enraged dragon on earth, 13 through 17. This chapter is not the last time we're going to see Satan. It's only just the beginning, actually, but he knows that this is the beginning of the end. And watch how he responds. Look at 13 again. When the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, I, I like that. It's like he kind of, oh, I've, I've been thrown down. When he saw that he had been thrown to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. What does he do? His rage turns against and towards the woman. We identified her earlier as Israel. His rage turns against the nation of Israel. 
Chuck Swindoll says, the nation that has known persecution from time immemorial will once again be the focus of Satan himself. In case you find this idea odd in any way, keep in mind we've already seen Israel in this book. In case this is sounding strange to you. We spoke of the 144,000 in chapter 7 being Jewish evangelists chosen from the 12 tribes who are listed in that text in those days. Jewish individuals who believe in Christ after the events of judgment and tribulation have begun. And bear in mind, just a few weeks ago in chapter 11, we saw persecution happening in the city of Jerusalem. Do you remember this? And the two witnesses emerge who many believe will be Israelites. Many point we spoke of in that message to possibly Elijah and Moses or to regular Israelites. So the presence of Israel is not foreign to us in this book and they will now become the target of Satan's fury. He is a cornered, furious dragon. However, look at 14 again. Beginning there, once again, we see the great protection of our God. The woman Israel is, uh, this, in this interesting, is given wings, speed, to escape into the wilderness where God protects and provides for her. Satan continues to pursue her in verse 15. We have this interesting image of a flood-like attack. Difficult to say exactly what this is describing in these days, though I would remind you that Jesus speaks of those in Judea needing to flee to the mountains when they see the Antichrist set up the abomination of desolation. That's Matthew 24. Interesting parallels there. Satan continues the attack, but God protects them yet again. The text speaks of that, look at it again, the earth opening up and swallowing this river from the dragon's mouth. By the way, don't miss the parallels of all of this to the Exodus. Do you see them? And Egypt pursuing the Israelites. God delivered Israel from slavery in Egypt. They make their way into where? The wilderness. Egypt. Their enemy pursues them. They're facing an obstacle that has to do with water. The Red Sea, God parts it so that Israel can cross, only to have their enemies uh, crushed under the water. The earth opens its mouth, so to speak. Interesting parallels here. God's protection is powerful in this time. And yet, the text ends on an ominous note. Look again at 17. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. I have no idea what that means at the very end. Caught my attention this week. I don't know. Who are the offspring, though? Who are the offspring? Great question. It's yet another part of this text that raises some different ideas. Are we talking about other Israelites who, for whatever reason, did not get to the place of safety? That's what Swindoll proposes, maybe. Are we talking about Gentile believers, tribulational believers? Some think so. Are we talking generally about God's people, meaning it could be a combination of both Israelites and tribulational believers. Those are all possibilities people point to. Wherever you land, don't miss the big picture. Satan's rage continues. He's not stopped by God's protection of these here. He goes here. In my mind, they're clearly believers, right? It says they keep the commandments of God. They hold to their testimony of Jesus. These are clearly tribulational believers, and Satan directs his rage at them in these final days. And by the way, that is a major, major theme of the next few chapters. This is setting the stage for the Antichrist and the false prophet and their activity in chapter 13. 
Satan knows his time is short, and here's the point. He is going to spend every minute he has on destroying the believers in that day, like the 144 evangelists and all who are believing. Their testimony and the testimony, of course, of the two witnesses as well. That's it, folks. We have made our way completely through this challenging text together. I know it's a lot to take in. I know there's a lot more we could say about certain elements of the account. I know it's hard to find our bearings as we've jumped. To, listen, the days before Advent Eve's temptation to Christmas, to the cross, to the ascension, to the tribulation. And you and I certainly know there are varying views on what these things mean. But as we close... I'd like to see if we can't find our bearings a bit, find our bearings. I'd like to simply pass along to you a few things that helped me in the open water this week. A couple quotes, a few thoughts. I'm going to share with you three questions overall and their answers that helped me with my bearings this week. Jot this down first. The question of where are we? Where are we? I think that'll help us. With all the time jumps in this chapter, where in the world are we generally, overall? Let me share with you a quote from John MacArthur that, that helped me and see if it helps you. He says this about where are we in this text. Although the seventh trumpet sounds in 1115, the judgments associated with it are not described until chapter 15. Listen, chapters 12 through 14 are a digression, taking readers back through the tribulation to the point of the seventh trumpet by a different path. They describe the tribulation not from God's perspective, but from Satan. Chapters 11, uh, excuse me, 4 through 11 focus on Christ taking back what is rightfully his by means of the seal and trumpet judgments. Chapters 12 through 14 focus on the ultimate human usurper, Satan, the final Antichrist, whose career spans, and the false prophet, I would add, whose career spans the same period as the seal and trumpet judgment. Do, do you hear what MacArthur is saying here about where we are? In our chapter today, chapter 12, and the next few weeks, we are looking at the events of the tribulation from a different perspective. There's some time overlap here, folks. In MacArthur's view, some of these things, like the battle of heaven, the fleeing of Israel to the desert, the fury of Satan, on Israel, believers, these things are overlapping with some of what we've already covered, but now we're seeing them and gaining Satan's perspective. What is he up to while these things have been happening and will be happening? Would you keep that in mind, please, in the next few weeks? I think that will help us in kind of our orientation of just where we are in these chapters. Helped me find my bearings a bit. Secondly, I'd like to uh, ask this question and attempt to answer it. Not just where are we, but who are we? Who are we? Where are we? Who are we? What this question is addressing is this. Clearly in this section of the book, Revelation 12, the believer is presented as the persecuted one. The persecuted one in the midst of a cosmic battle. I would have you write that down. We are the persecuted ones in the midst of a cosmic battle. That's who we are. We are presented in the midst of this battle. Let's talk about that battle first. If nothing else, folks, you and I should notice this morning that this chapter is telling us of the battle between God and his forces of good and Satan, and his forces of evil. Last week, we talked about the invasion. Do you remember? Christ coming to this earth, and the earth becoming the domain of his perfect rule, free from the presence of sin. C.S. Lewis, you recall, called it the invasion. 
Listen, folks, if there's an invasion, <laughs> there's going to be some what? There's going to be some battles, some battles. Satan knows his time is short, the text says, and he is going to fight. And part of that fight, hear me please, part of that fight clearly is Satan going all out to destroy God's people on the earth in those days. Alan Johnson puts it this way. This intermediary section preceding the final bull judgments picks up and develops. We've seen this theme already. The, the theme of the persecution of God's people, which has already appeared in this book. Chapter 12 gives us a glimpse into the dynamics of the persecution of God's people under the symbolism of the dragon who wages war on the woman and her children. Chapter 13 continues, next week, continues the same theme by telling of the persecution of the saints by the dragon energized beasts, the Antichrist and the false prophet. Persecuted ones. That is who we are in this chapter, in this book. You remember how much it talked about persecution to the addresses in the seven churches in Turkey. Now, we're talking about the tribulational period here this morning, but please let us remind ourselves believer, <laughs> that we are a part of this cosmic battle right now, aren't we? We cannot forget 1 Peter 5.8. Peter, who's writing to believers, said, be and watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, listen, seeking someone to devour. Do you remember that text? We cannot forget Ephesians 6.12. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities and cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the armor of God, Paul says. That's our reality now, believer. Not just in those days, the last days. There is a spiritual war and Satan seeks to destroy God's people like we see played out in this chapter. That's who we are, a very good orientation point on the open water, I think. Finally, let me offer this to you by way of helping us find our bearings in Revelation 12. Let me ask the question, what are the unique contributions of this text? What are the contributions of this text? That's to ask, among the whole of Revelation, why chapter 12? What's its place? What is it uniquely showing us that we've yet to see? I think this is a good way to get our bearings a bit. Let me mention three briefly to you as we close. Number one, Satan emerges in this chapter. He emerges in this chapter. Please don't forget what we said last week. We said that so far in this book, Satan has been pretty quiet but not after today and not in the next few weeks as we study. Satan really for the first time emerges before us in chapter 12. And please notice this, folks. Therefore, this book is not just about God judging human sin. That's a big part of it. But it's also about Satan, that ancient serpent, that longtime opponent of God being dealt with. If Christ is invading the kingdom of this world and setting up a thousand year reign on earth and ushering in the eternal state, new heaven, new earth, if that's happening, Satan has to be eliminated and dealt with, doesn't he? And here in chapter 12, we see this last great conflict begin between God and Satan. That's a unique contribution of this chapter. What does it mean practically for us? We cannot overlook or ignore the reality of Satan and evil forces in our lives. We can't. It has been stated often and by multiple different people, we tend to go to extremes when it comes to the reality of evil spiritual forces. On one hand, we don't believe them at all, their existence, or we do, but we totally ignore the reality in our lives. Or... On the other hand, we give Satan way too much credit and power and attention. 
avoid the extremes and realize the presence of the ancient enemy of God and his people. Number two, speaking of that, I think the chapter secondly gives us the unique contribution of drawing the reality out that Satan has real hatred for the people of God. Real hatred for the people of God. Can't ignore that in this text. It's a new thought, sort of, in this book. It's clear in this chapter. Satan pursues the woman to persecute her, and then when he's banished from heaven, his fury is turned upon the woman again on the earth. Let's not get so caught up in interpreting each, interpreting each sign perfectly that we ignore that big picture reality. We have an enemy that in fury seeks to destroy you, believer. Now, I'm applying this truth to both the believer and the nation of Israel. I think you can consider both in this text. D.A. Carson is a uh, brilliant pastor and scholar. He's actually, uh, I think, uh, teaches New Testament at the Ephraim Seminary in the Chicago area. He does a couple of the, the sessions in the Simeon course on apocalyptic literature. We saw one earlier. That wasn't him, but he does a couple. And in one of those sessions that I watched, he speaks of World War II in relation to our chapter. He's talking about chapter 12, and he speaks of World War II. He says, quote, yes, there are human reasons for why we had World War II. Germany's terrible state at the end of World War I and them looking to someone to restore their glory. And there's human reasons, right, for World War II. But Carson continues, if you can't see the spiritual realities going on in that war, you are blind as a bat, he says. I love that. Blind as a bat. Now, I would love to sit down after that session with Carson and have lunch and, and ask him, hey, um, what spiritual realities do you see in World War II? Which is basically admitting I'm blind as a bat, right? But I'd love to sit down with him and ask him that question. Just pick his brain. Can I wager a guess, though? Would you allow me to wager a guess? I think he would point to the fury of Satan against the nation of Israel. I think that's at least one thing he would point to. You see it in World War II at the Holocaust. You see it in any number of other historical examples of people desiring to see Israel eliminated altogether or at least in their area of the globe. I'm pretty confident he would point to that in World War II as an example of Satan's fury against God's people in terms of Israel. However, however, for the born-again believer in Jesus Christ, Jew or Gentile, we also know Satan's fury is against us. We've already mentioned 1 Peter 5 and Ephesians 6. Listen, are there human reasons why we suffer and are persecuted as a church? Are there human reasons why our ministry efforts at times here at New Life are frustrated as a church? Yes, there are human reasons. But if we ignore the fact that Satan is actively pursuing the believer and seeking to frustrate the gospel that goes forth in your life personally and through our church, if we ignore that, we're blind as a bat. Grant Osborne says this, I liked this, Spiritual warfare is all too often neglected in the life of the average Christian. It seems as if we're all trying to be Switzerland's and remain neutral in this war. To be neutral is to lose, however, for Satan is real and his hatred towards all those who are made in the image of God is not to be ignored. To think that Satan and his forces are not actively scheming and planning against you and our church is an oversight on our part, and that's putting it pretty mildly. What's our response? So what do we do? Do we direct all of our teaching towards Satan and all of our prayers towards it? No, no. We wake up. We stay alert. To use some of the First Peter 5 language, we be on guard. We resist. We pray. We put on the armor of God. We counter his deception and lies with the truth of God's word. Make sure your intake of the word is more than just Sunday morning. 
This chapter gives us the unique contribution of showing us the reality of the spiritual battle that we are in. Satan hates the people of God, and this chapter introduces that idea. And by the way, it is coming more and more and more in the next few chapters. Finally, I say this. This chapter gives us the unique contribution of showing us God's powerful protection and victory. How do we find our bearings in this chapter? It's about Satan in the end times. He's there, he's active, he emerges. It's about the reality of Satan pursuing the people of God. Why do we suffer the way that we do? Are there human reasons? Yes, but don't ignore the spiritual. But it is also clearly about the fact that God powerfully protects his people and he powerfully defeats Satan. Notice the protection again in the chapter. He prepared, play, uh, prepared a place for his people in verse 6. He nourished them, protected them. He gives them wings to flee. He opens the earth to protect them from Satan's attack. Don't miss the protection. Now, a quick word there. That doesn't necessarily mean that God's people will be spared from death. Okay? In fact... If we go there in our minds, we are totally missing a huge theme of this book. Because martyrdom is a huge theme of this book. We've already seen martyrs in this book. We're going to see more <laughs> in the weeks to come. Even in this chapter today, we see them in the song of heaven. They love not their lives even unto death. And yet... It is said of them that they overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. Satan cannot touch the eternal life given to the believer through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. Right? Martin Luther. God's protection of his people is perfect. Satan does not touch us without God's sovereign will being played out. And even if we die, even if we're killed for a testimony of Christ, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. God's protection is powerful. God's victory is powerful. It's my favorite part of the chapter, the end of verse 12. Satan knows his time is short. <laughs> I love that. Satan is called the ancient uh, serpent in this chapter, but the one who crushed the head of the serpent, though his heel was bruised, will have the ultimate victory. Satan is called the deceiver of the whole world in this chapter, but the one who is full of grace and truth will have the ultimate victory. Satan is called the accuser of the brethren in this chapter, but the one who stands before the throne of God as our great high priest. Book of Hebrews will have the ultimate victory. Worship team, you come. Lord, we thank you for this challenging but beautiful chapter. If nothing else, we see there's a battle. And we see that we're in it. I mean, we're, we're involved. We have an enemy that... Um, in fury, in rage, uh, pursues the people of God. Whether you want to apply that to Israel, the church, both. Very clear, pursues God's people. And Lord, we visit other texts today, 1 Peter 5, Ephesians 6, and it's confirmed. We are in a battle as the people of God, believers, the church. Father, uh, the, the word uses terms like alertness, soberness, prayer, standing against, um, resisting, certainly resisting temptation. Um, Father, I pray that you would uh, help us to find a good balance here, not, not ignoring the battle, but not giving it every waking a moment of attention and all our teaching directed toward that. I mean, we, we just we tend to go to extremes, God. Help us to handle this rightly as, as individuals and as a corporate church as well. We thank you, above all, for the blood of the Lamb. 
for by it we conquer. This text draws out. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Let's sing one closing song together. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control me, steady me. Christ has regarded my helpless estate, has shed his own blood for my soul. Lord, we thank you that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. There's nothing in our own strength and merit. It is by Christ. I pray that you would use that to encourage the believer today. I pray that you would use that to draw uh, the one who is seeking today to the person and work of Jesus Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.